Javier, my friend, always a pleasure to be with you. How are you? Always a pleasure. I am very well, very well. Uh, very happy with today's interview. How are you doing? Doing good, doing good. You're very well, always busy. Javier Jate, leading cannabis journalist in the industry. And I get the privilege of chatting with you multiple times a week. Big shout out to the cannabis team, by the way, at, at Benzinga. Benzinga.com slash cannabis for your daily dose of cannabis news. If you thought we reported on a bunch of news before when we had 30 articles a day, check out Benzinga Cannabis now. We're reporting on everything you can imagine and then so. So Benzinga.com slash cannabis. Like, honestly, like I love it. And honestly, a big helpful tool to me is your newsletter it comes out every day, at, I think around 5 p.m. Eastern time. It's a wrap up of all the major news items of the day. And if you want to start off your day right, just listen to the podcast, Cannabis Daily, every morning around 10 a.m. on Spotify, Apple, our website, wherever you listen to podcasts. Oh, yeah. Outside I, of that, I do. There's a bunch of people who don't love reading. So like five your, minutes. You like your audio. Oh, yeah. While yeah. you're driving to work. Speaking of podcasts, we're technically doing one right now. You can listen to all these interviews as well. But we have a really cool guest today, two guests actually, to come talk to us about so AFC Gamma. So this is AFCG on the NASDAQ, uh, the, one of the leading, um, I can't say the leading, we're not supposed to be subjective, but definitely one of the leading <laughs> REITs in the cannabis space. That is a real estate investment trust. They're here to tell us about their business. This is Lynn and Robin Tannenbaum. Javier Hase, very excited for this interview. Shall we dive in? Let's bring them on. Advance Flower Capital right now on Benzinga Cannabis Insider. <laughs> Lynn, Robin, welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us. You know, tell us about your origin story because I want this to lead us into how you two dove into cannabis. I started a company called Fifth Street. We built it into a $5 billion asset manager. We sold it to Oak Tree. They've done a terrific job, became a family office, went on our own, spent time with the kids, family, parents, all that good stuff. Found cannabis among family offices on the last time it dipped. And the first investment was tough. Second investment was a little bit more learning experience. Third investment was Cure Leaf. And so we got to learn a lot about the best operator in the space. Fourth investment, Harvest, right? Ends up selling to True Leaf. And fifth investment, Nature's Medicine, where I learned a lot and were one of the larger equity owners, realized how big an opportunity. Called my friends. I'm like, okay, what's going on here? Why is there this great arbitrage? Why is there this great opportunity in lending to cannabis? Where the hell are all the lenders? Where's the institutional lenders in the space? And they said, we'd love to do that, right? We'd love to have... Uh, lending in the space, but we're, you know, the scared of that 0.001% chance. And at the time, there had not been a NASDAQ listed lender. Uh, we I'd listed a whole bunch on NASDAQ. So I said to my wife, I said, if you're willing to do this with me, uh, and we did this with the kids in coronavirus on the back of a napkin, I sketched this out because she has much more energy, you know, than I'd, I've done this before. And, and, and to do it as a partner would be so much better. And she said, yes. So she became my partner. Room in the house, you know, in the middle of coronavirus with my kids around, you know, we started Advanced Flower. When it comes to uh, the lending space in cannabis, you know, there's <laughs> there's a lot of successful stories. There's a lot of hesitations, right? I think about lending in cannabis. It, so it's not really necessarily a saturated market on the successful side. But, you know, in terms of how you're attacking some of these hesitations in the space, like per, like cost of capital, things of that nature, you know, what are you doing differently for, from other lenders in this industry? I mean, looking at the other lenders in the industry, first of all, they're not that many. You right. see four guys on every deal. The biggest uh, competitors are Seaport and Canaccord, who have aggregated a bunch of hedge funds that are, want to be in the space, that have come in behind them as sort of screen and cover to be able to invest in the bigger syndicated deals. But then when they when the companies have a problem, oh my God, they're, they're stuck with 15, 20, 30 hedge funds as syndicate partners, and they're going to charge them and or not listen to their problem. They're not partners, right? They're, they're, they're just investing along for the yield. And that's a problem where we are a relationship lender. And so we're a large scale. We're getting to be a large scale. We're not large yet. We're getting mid scale, but we're going to be a large scale uh, relationship lender. Uh, look, Verano puts out the release, you know, or, or, or we'll draw our credit line again. It will be over a hundred million dollars exposed to Verano. And, and it'll be, it, I'm not supposed to say that yet. <laughs> well, it's not out yet. And, and you know, but they're, they're a terrific company, right? They own their real estate. They've operated really well. They have huge cash flows. They have huge EBITDAs. They're like the perfect perfect client because they really understand how to operate, but also they're not stuck in margin compressing sale leasebacks, equipment leases and all that, and all of that stuff. And they're really well diversified across the country. So if we can lend to people like Verano at great rates, 
which for us, right, the 10 to 12% range for the top MSOs, I mean, that's a really, a really great value proposition for the shareholders. And then I think what differentiates us is, is one, hold size, right? As Len described earlier, there's not a lot of lenders that can commit to a deal, lead the deal, structure the deal, and also the ability to expand with the company as we continue to expand. And then that partnership flexible aspect where we understand what our borrowers are doing. We're very focused on the state-by-state dynamics. We make sure that we understand their business models, their growth prospects, which gives them the ability to come back to us and say, hey, we want to enter the state or we won this license in this state. Can we expand our loan? And, and that's a unique proposition. That- but Ellie, you're right. There's been a lot of lenders that have problems and, the, and there's going to be a lot of defaults in the industry. And I, we think they're around California, Oregon, Washington, Mass, Oklahoma. We have stayed out of it entirely. We are not invested in the unlimited license states, those unlimited license states. We, we do have a little bit of Michigan exposure. That's sort of an unlimited license state. We've really focused on cash flows, licenses, and real estate as security. And those limited licenses are really important and keep that to keep the competition from being too crazy to, to press pricing. And so that's really an important underwriting thesis of ours. So we have a really strong portfolio. Um, and we're a public company. You can see our strength of the portfolio. We have no defaults. We have no payment defaults. We have, you know, actually nothing really stressed right now. And and it's it's, it's and, and in an environment where you're right, right? There's a lot of October was very tough on the cannabis industry. You can have a lot of fourth quarter surprises on the yeah. downside. Yeah. Lots of California bankruptcies, I think. We saw Arizona 5 uh, grows close their doors because they just couldn't operate uh, and have a right marginal cost. You know, so we're, we're very careful about where we want to underwrite and who we want to underwrite to. Now, you just mentioned uh, the value proposition for shareholders, right? And, and you know, from what I understand, your your model is pretty light on the personnel side, right? You, you don't seem to have a lot of expenses. To, what's the size of the team, right? Like, what are your expenses and what, how are you making money, right? Like, what is the actual value proposition for investors? A lot of retail investors watch this show. So the value proposition. So we have about 25 people, somewhere between 25 and 30. It, it changes every day and we are rapidly hiring, I'd say, to find the right team, mem- the right additional team members to supplement the amazing core team that we already have in place. So from our shareholders perspective, what's great both for institutional shareholders, which we're very institutionally held currently in retail shareholders, is you get access to a diverse portfolio of cannabis operators. So you're not just buying one operator, you're buying a portfolio. Currently, we have 17 borrowers. You're buying a portfolio of those borrowers. And we have a very attractive yield. We declared our dividend on a run rate basis is a $2 dividend per year. We just paid 50 cents on January 15th. So from a retail perspective, given where we're trading, we have almost a 10% dividend yield. So I think that's very attractive as well as getting exposure to the cannabis sector without having to invest directly into operators. But it, you're you're right. Though. It takes a lot of people. And I think we have more people than any of our competitors from what I, what I understand. And it's not only the people. We have an in-house construction management person. We have an in-house portfolio management. By the way, you got to work out some problems when there are problems, right? You have a portfolio monitoring management team. You have an underwriting team. You know, Robin leads that great origination team and, and supervises the IR team. Then you'd have an entire accounting back office, right? With CFOs and controllers, et cetera. So it takes valuation specialists. So it takes all of those things to operate the platform correctly. And uh, we're, we're still building. We're, we're, I can't tell you 26 or 27 is enough. Like we keep hiring. <laughs> well, I can't fault you all for being a growing company in a growing industry. <laughs> that doesn't seem right to do. Um, but sticking kind of on the same topic, uh, you know, last year, I, I would say, for lack of, of a better clarification here off the top of my head, REIT stocks were some of the strongest in 2021. Going into 2022, yeah, the markets are still kind of not so great, but at the same time, you know, there's a lot of hope. There's some M&A that was announced recently. Verano, you know, there, there's some interesting things happening, but do you still see REIT stocks leading the way and or being one of the leading drivers for shareholders to benefit in this industry? I just don't consider, I get that we're a REIT and I get that our investors get the tax benefit of us being a qualified REIT, which means you get the 20% off of the income. So not only do you get a great 10% yield, you get 20, you get a tax discount, which is even better. And now you have liquidity, right? We're trading 150, 200,000 shares a day. So you can actually buy it and sell it without you know much trouble in, in size. So that all of those things really are terrific. But I think of us as a cannabis lender. It doesn't matter whether it's a REIT format or a different format to, to lend to. It's really all about the industry, the industry's growth and partnering with these up and coming companies and some established companies and trying to trying to figure out who the 15 or 20 winners in the industry will be once all the states are covered. 
you know, you were you were talking a lot about family offices, how how you funded this this project originally, you know, with family offices. And I assume that has a lot to do with your connections, but also with with, you know, big institutional investors still staying away from the industry. Is this something that you continue to see or the fact that you are a REIT, which is a very traditional investment, that there is, you know, a, a hard asset tied to all the uh, project. Are you seeing any institutional investors approach you? approach the industry or is it still very much of a family office kind of situation? So it's definitely institutionally backed because, and you can look at our holders list, whether, you know, they're very, very large, reputable institutions that, are, and in fact, the biggest problem is the opposite. The biggest problem is there's none of retail. That they're, no, it's a big problem. We're about 80, 85% institute. Either I, I have about 20, 17% of the stock myself. So I'm the largest shareholder by far. You know, our large institutions then own most of the rest of it. And there's 15% retail. And Very that's unique. Super unique for cannabis, at least, right? But it doesn't, the reason is so many of the big systems can't buy the stock, whether it's Morgan Stanley or Bank of America with Merrill Lynch, which some of the biggest systems, you can buy it on Robinhood, I heard, you can buy it, right? You can buy it on TD, you can buy it on Schwab, but there's no large wire houses that will push this retail or have their brokers look into it and in brokerage accounts have the ability to do do retail. But I think institutions have gotten comfortable and, and are, as Len said, some of our largest holders. And that's also because obviously we're NASDAQ listed. Right. So we have the NASDAQ seal of approval. So that seal of approval being legally listed on NASDAQ has given institutions a lot of comfort that what we're doing is obviously completely legal. Yeah, so I, look, I, we really look forward to more retail support. We think more of it will come with Safe Act, and that, you know that, that does dovetail into this whole thing. There's pluses and minuses to the legislation that's being proposed over the next couple of years. And one of the nice things about it, right, is you can have much broader retail ownership, which is really important for high yielding stocks. I mean, we can ask for predictions if we want, but you know, I, I think, you know, listening to you talk about limited versus limited license states, do you foresee any type of interstate commerce taking part in any upcoming legislation, we'll say, in any of the legislations that have been uh, introduced, do you think that will be a part of it? And how would that affect you all? Well, let's even talk about why Chuck Schumer is so misguided. So Chuck Schumer is from the state of New York. Last time I thought about senators, they should love the state they're in and the people that elect them into the office. The state of New York just declared rec. Great idea. 2023, they're going to roll out rec and they're bragging about six, seven, eight hundred million dollars of tax revenue and the benefits it's going to do to minorities. Terrific. And minority businesses. Great idea. Guess what? Interstate commerce destroys all of that. It, all, the, all the marijuana is going to be grown in California. Now, that is not going to help his constituents in the state of New York. It's just not. So why would he think that this is a good idea for his state? And by the way, 48 of the 50 states agree to that. 48 of the 50 states really follow this whole thing where they, they, they want their tax revenue, they want their businesses, they want their employment. Mm -hmm. Right. So so that, that's what this is all about. So I don't think there's any chance of interstate commerce. Yeah. And looking at maybe some of the bills that are out there, perhaps the States Reform Act, is that probably the closest one to what we have right now on a legalized stature? I mean, we have Safe yeah. Act. So yeah. Safe, Safe, Act. Safe, Act, Safe Act is much better. Safe Act is going to allow transactions, Visa, MasterCard, only 15% of the revenue of all of our stores. They'll give mm -hmm. more banks to deposit in. Banks can be a little bit more aggressive, but not really competing with us. Still relatively small hold size, but legitimizes the industry, more retail, more wirehouses, more institutions. So we really hope Safe Act passes. I think it's it'll it'll be a real issue down the road for a lot of the infrastructure if it fully legalizes. I think at the end of the day, it's like the States Act, right? Which is each state will have the right to approve uh, all of the legislation, the testing. Think about all the jobs. You have cultivation, retail, testing, regulation, all within a state that that all the all that job creation and taxation. Jumping a little bit from from policy to philanthropy, if you will. Yeah, that's right. Um, What's up with the with the AFC Foundation? I, I heard something about it. I, I heard you were launching it. Can you tell us a little bit about the idea there and what you expect to accomplish? 
Sure. So one of the most important things is to give back to the community. And obviously, currently, the companies that we back are, are involved in their local communities. So we set up AFC Foundation as a method to give back to those local communities. So in states that AFC Gamma has borrowers in, we're going to team up with those borrowers where they donate and, and we make a, a donation as well to support those local communities. And that can be in the form of children's programs, homelessness, veterans, just finding ways to work with those operators in the communities that they operate in to support the local communities and give back. And not only are 100% of our employees uh, going to donate, we've actually just decided that we're going to put, to start, to really facilitate this effort, we're going to put $250,000 out, our, our, out of our management company. You can add that to our cost of expenses. But it's, <laughs> if you have to get back, right? That, and, that's, and that's really what's important is, is, but the cool thing about this partnership is we're going to all of our borrowers and we're saying, look, if you want to put $5,000 or $10,000, we'll double it. So you come up with a great charity, Put you put 10, we'll put 20, so we give $30,000. And that's important that they invest too, right? Because they can like a charity and they can think one's important, but unless they're putting their own money, right? That it's not the same recommendation to me, right? We want everybody yeah. invested in this and doing this as a partnership approach. And so we expect to on in how many states do we operate in? 13, 14? Currently operate in 16 states. 16. Um, <laughs> growing obviously over time. And, and it's something that we're gonna be very focused on really supporting those states and working with those borrowers to ensure that we're making as much of an impact as we can through those domains. That's fantastic. Awesome. Well, I look forward to hearing more more on that, the updates that come from that. But it does take me to a question regarding, you mentioned states, looking ahead and looking through 2022, you said 16, 17 markets you're in right now? Sorry. Yep. Okay. How many or, or what new states are, are you anxious for looking through the year ahead? So I would say cannabis is in the middle innings. They've accomplished uh, many of the states already, but there's still a, a couple of very large states to go, which are required multi-billion dollar build outs. So obviously the hottest state, and you saw the announcement from Verano in, in, in making that acquisition, they acquired one of the 10 vertical licenses in New York. So New York is right now the hottest state in the country by far, mm -hmm. with the most price paid for a vertical license that I've seen. It has that potential, right? New York's size is enormous. Its its adoption of cannabis should exceed 5% of the population, if not 5% already in New York. It's already legalized, right? So it decriminalized and legalized. And it's going to be just an incredible state. So that first mover advantage is critical. And uh, we actually back another New York licensee called Acreage that we lent 100. We co-lent, we agented a $100 million loan and held $70 million. And uh, Acreage also has one of the 10 New York licenses. Licenses. So it's, it's another very special case in where they, they're already building a massive grow and they're getting ready for that legalization push. New Jersey continues to issue an issue and, and trend towards legalization. The problem with all of these things is it takes time. Connecticut's going to be huge. So Connecticut, New Jersey, New York is one focal point. If you look beyond that, you're thinking about Georgia's six license holders and Georgia's all, you know, two thirds of the state of Florida. Of Florida. Atlanta's going to be the major. It's very centered around Atlanta, which is 60% of the demographic. So that's going to be all those six license holders are going to crush it. First mover advantage there is going to be big. You got to move that THC level up from five. A long laggard, a big state like Texas, where there's only 1% THC limit, people are going to lose a ton of money in Texas for a while. But eventually, it's going to be a great state after a lot of oh, yeah. money losing. And so and, and it's an enormous state. So I think Texas will be very interesting, but as New Mexico goes wreck on its border, how many people are going to cross over from Texas and buy in El Paso and New Mexico? You know, I think, you know, there's going to be some beneficiaries until it goes legal or, or, or expands its medical program more um, on the border. So we're watching all of the dynamics around the country. Uh, just like you put out your report every week. I'm like, I don't quite do that, but we meet every, well, every day you guys put it out. Every week we meet, go through the data, go through what we're learning, go through the state by state change and the legislative changes and the limited license states. If you ask me about California, I really don't know much. We don't lend there. We're, we just watched the pounds, you know, crush below 300. And, and the, it, we're really focused in those supply and demand dynamics. And I knew 72 licenses yesterday or today or yesterday. From yesterday Ohio. in Ohio. Yeah, yesterday, you know, Ohio said here's 72 more dispensaries. So the grows there are going to make a ton of money. Robin, Lynn, any last words you all would like? to leave our audience in terms of what they should keep an eye on in 2022. I think we touched on a lot of that, but anything else you want the individual investors that are considering cannabis as a part of their portfolio to know? Look, I think cannabis, there's very few 
industries and investments that you can think of that are really just not correlated to a lot of the other stuff that's going on in the markets. And I, I actually think the markets are relatively frothy. That's my personal view. Um, and there's a lot of bubble and the Fed's pulling the bubble back. But at the same time, if you look through coronavirus, you had expanded cannabis use and, and, and cannabis really is like not counter cyclical, but non-correlated type of investment, which I really like. You really do have to understand and appreciate how difficult it is though. This is really difficult industry. So as you're analyzing the stocks, Really look for cash flows. Don't believe adjusted EBITDA. You really want to get in there and understand what's free cash flow and what's their cost of capital and how are their margins and how are their margins moving. It's really hard. If you look for stocks also, it really management is so important in this industry, much more important than any other because management is a leadership stake, but also how risk taking they are and how much leverage they take and what's their general mentality and leadership skills are so important. And so you see great companies like Verano really because that management has done such a great job getting to where they are. And you've seen a lot of failures and there's failures in the market today. And mm -hmm. that's because management did, did not really understand what we're doing. So be careful, uh, invest with invest and in, in who you can trust and who you've done your work on. Uh, but I think it's, I'm really excited about the growth. I'm excited and happy every day to come to work with my wife and, and build a company. That is Our couple. <laughs> I Love it. Robin, Lynn, it's been a pleasure. Thank you both so much for being here. Robin, props to you for putting up with that man next to you. <laughs> I do deserve a lot of credit. This is nice enough. Come on. Uh, thank you both so much for being here. We're super anxious to follow your story. Uh, story. I believe you'll be with us in Miami in well. April. Uh, very excited to see you both in person. Uh, everybody watching this, come and talk to them in person in Miami. We'd love to see you at bzcannabis.com, but we will see you all soon. Thanks again. Thanks, Elliot. Thank you. All right, that's it for us today. Cannabis Insider Special. Thank you all so much for being here. We'll see you again next time. See you.